So good evening, everyone. Um, basically, I'm here to present uh, Pinto, CPAN in a box. Um, basically, what is Pinto? Pinto was written by Jeffrey Ryan Fallhammer. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Basically, he'd been on a consultant on many projects with many employers, and each time he was asked to create some way of managing uh, modules and their distributions because they wanted to have their own stack of a way of you know of what they were trying to install. And after the third or fourth time, he finally was able to s build it from scratch, and he called it Pinto. So Pinto is basically it's a CPAN-like repository, but you have total control. You can create and manage uh, you know, as many uh, stacks as they're called within the repo, and we'll get into what stacks are later, and uh, basically creates uh, for the creating the modules and installing modules is probably one of the coolest points. Just as if you would use CPAN or CPAN minus or CPAN plus to install a module, you can install modules from your Pinto repo. The, the other cool part is that Pinto also allows you to pull from CPAN itself a module and install local modules. So you can then test out things locally before you push your own stuff up you know, to CPAN. Uh, why use Pinto? Well, I think I talked a few of those. Uh, basically, CPAN authors can make mistakes. Even very well-intentioned CPAN authors can tarball up their uh, dist with uh, the Mac tar, which doesn't play nice with Linux, which then basically, it still untars if you're doing it by hand, but blows up anybody trying to do it by CPAN. And five hours after I did that, I got an angry email from someone saying, you know, this isn't cool, you just broke my project. So uh, just because it's on CPAN doesn't mean it's foolproof. We, uh, you know, as module uh, developers, we can put up things that just don't work, that have errors. And you don't want that, especially if you're doing that in a production environment, which, of course, you never want to just be simply doing a CPAN install on your dev box. But I've done that in the past, so it's a bad idea. Uh, Pinto allows for creating unique stacks or ind indices, and we'll get into more of that. Uh, CPAN and other uh, online repositories, they only have the one index, which is this is the current index. With, uh, with Pinto, you can create a dev, a master, a production. Uh, this is how I feel today stack. So that's uh, great for that. Um, again, it allows for working with CPAM modules locally and uh, the ones that are up on the cloud. And uh, Pinto has logging, which I think is really cool. Just kind of like Git, which uh, seems to be more and more where Pinto is heading, is uh, you can see with, hash, uh, with uh, SHAs and everything who did what when, and you can undo those things. So that, that's kind of nice. What Pinto doesn't do, I wanted to call this why not use Pinto, but I felt that that wasn't in the spirit of this presentation. But uh, Pinto does not do any security. Um, and when I uh, speak of this, it's the Pinto command line uh, program, which is the core of Pinto. There are other ways of accessing your Pinto repos that do offer some type of security. But uh, just Pinto by itself, if you install it from CPEN, no security. Anybody who has access to your box has access to add, remove, upgrade. You know, they're basically an administrator, as kind of like you. Uh, also, <clears throat> Pinto right now is uh, the current version is 0 .00996, so definitely a long way from being a quote unquote stable product, as far as its more you know as as its newer features are involved. The core features of basically adding things, those things are solid, they're there, but it's definitely, there are many things to come down the pipeline. They look cool, but um, there are times when you're gonna see something and say, well, that's just lacking, you're kinda have to do some code diving to figure out what it's actually doing or why it's doing. Um, but again, the core functionality of it, as far as creating a stack and a repo, is strong and it's there. It's just the niceties are devel uh, developing as time goes on. So the first thing I want to always mention up is, and is definitely a mark of a good program, is the help. What kind of help does it give you? Besides the, uh, the pod pages that you can see, there are <coughs> the three commands. Pinto commands, basically it lists every command that it has available. And the nice thing is, is if you do Pinto and then mistype your command, it will spin out this thing. In fact, if you just type in Pinto, it spins out all the commands, so you're always safe that way. You don't have to guess at, is it dash dash help, or is it dash help something, or... So once you have the command Pinto help, that gives you a real abbreviated version of, here are the popular arguments, this is how you want to use it, here's the syntax. Pinto manual command gives you an actual man page with uh, more information. Again, if you're looking for some more fine-grained information, it may not be there yet. And, uh, but the, as far as being able to run the commands, you'll have everything that you need. So your Pinto repository. 
So to create a Pinto repository, you basically call init on it. The one cumbersome thing is you always have to tell it where its root is at. So you can do Pinto with dash dash root in the uh, directory or just dash r. Or once you figure this out and get really tired of typing this, you can just export Pinto repository root to the environmental variables and then you just Pinto init. Trust me, even if you're in the directory, you still need to you know, specify the root and even typing Pinto dash r dot gets cumbersome after a while. And I just put my computer to sleep. <laughs> you could be giving this presentation. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I guess B blacks out the screen for reasons I don't know why. Okay, so. <clears throat> Once you've uh, created your uh, repository, oh, I'm sorry, one thing I forgot to mention. When you hit uh, Pinto init and you give it the source directory, it will create the directory if it doesn't exist. If it does exist and it's not empty, it will throw an error and not create the directory. So uh, best to, if you're going to run init, run it on a directory that doesn't exist yet. So basically, once you've created it, we need to you know, populate it with some things. So it's real easy. You want to get a module off CPAN, use the pull command. So Pinto, where my repo's at, pull, test more. If you want to add it locally, you basically use the add uh, command instead of pull, and then you give it the directory to your tarball. Again, this will have to be uh, tarred up as it is through anything uh, through any of the modules that help you create your own modules. So it has to have metafiles and has to have a certain structure. Pinto is looking for that typical module structure, especially the metadata. That's where it gets all its information from. So now that we've pulled that, we want to see what's in our repo. So we do a list. It's really s that simple, pretty much the same thing. And you can see there's my module. Of course, we also pulled in test more, but it's not here. I'm great at, you know, if I don't see a big error, I don't really pay attention to it. So the big thing to, to remember is always read the command line. I, and I'm just adding this in because it kind of surprised me. And when you do the p test, mo uh, test pull, test more, I'm sorry, pinto pull, test more, you can see it says it's skipping it because it's included in the core of Perl. So basically, one of the limitations of pinto is it will not pull anything in that's either a version behind or already loaded in the Perl version that you have. Basically, if it comes already installed in the system, Pinto's not going to do anything with it. And this is basically its way of, of telling you it's there, you're not managing it. So that's just, I wanted to throw that in there because that caught me off guard while I was putting the presentation together. So this time I decided to pull in URI uh, uh, module in, and this time the list shows us a lot more information. And as you can see, it pulls in URI and then all of URI's dependencies. And that's what it'll do, is it'll give you, you know, it won't tell you that this is what it's doing. You'll just notice it's taking longer because it's pulling everything. If you want UR, URI, you also need all these other modules with it. You can't install it without these guys helping it. And That is correct. If one of the dependencies of URI is part of core per, or Perl, it will not be listed here. But then again, that goes back to you're building it against this version of Perl, and you don't have any control over it. I mean, unless you, if, again, I guess this will be one of the cons. Pinto is not going to give you any help if you're working on a home compiled version of Perl where you've really messed up things internally, and especially with any type of uh, metadata for it. So, um, You know, that's a great question. I did not get into different versions of Perl on the same machine. It's basically going off of uh, what, um, everything that I've done here is going off of what the, the default version of Perl is. So if you do have different versions of Perl on, all you would need to do is uh, basically point your environmental variable, and I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Perl lib. Well, Perl if you're using Perl Brew, it will automatically <coughs> figure out which, whatever version that Right, but the, uh, the question is basically, yeah, if we're using Perl Brew or Homebrew or something, how does uh, Pinto know what to do with it? And it's basically which version of Perl you're pointing to. So if you change your environmental variables to point to a specific version of Perl, I, that's something that you would have to, on your own, keep track of. Pinto does not keep track of this. That's a great question. I didn't even think about that. So. One thing I was just thinking 
of two, if you really, really, really wanted to update test more, you could just go download the tarball from CPAN and then load it. Manually. Right, yeah, if you still wanted to add test more, you could uh, do it via adding the tarball. And that actually comes in well if you're dealing with um, errors you found in modules and you want to add your own patched version, saying, like, let's pretend that test more for whatever reason. Or most recently, actually, uh, um, uh, Devel Cover, uh, we had some issues with that. So we could have, at that point in time, downloaded, patched it, and then added the patched version to our Pinto repo if we had that. And then that way, yeah, that's a great way of being able to circumvent things that are in the core, in the core of Perl. So now that we have a repo, it's, I mean, it's really as good as, uh, as a, like, CPAN is or PAWS is. It, it just has the one index. It doesn't do us any good. So what, uh, that's where stacks come in. Stacks are basically are the index, and you can create as many stacks as you want. And uh, just as a, as a side note, the default stack is master. When you, create your, uh, when you create your repo, the repo gets a stack called master, and everything you check in by default goes into that, into that stack. Now, you can change the default value if you want to, or the, which, uh, which brand stack is the default. Sorry, I'm getting Git and uh, Pinto confused a little bit. Um, you can change that, but I'm not going to get into that here. So basically, once you have your uh, repo, then you can basically create a new stack by simply doing pinto new dev. Or if you wanted to get clone a uh, current repo, let's say you have your master stack and now you want to test something new out, you would just simply do pinto copy master to dev. Now mind you, you can only do one of those two. If you create a dev and then try to do the copy command, it will error out on you. The, the stack that you want to clone something into cannot exist. So uh, this is a, a very marketable way that, that re, uh, Pinto is not like it. There's no, once you change, let's say we have a div, dev stack, and we say, okay, this is good. We want to put now make master look like this. There's no, let's merge it in. You basically would have to re-import, read, add, add everything as you did in your dev stack onto your master stack. To see what stacks you have, you just do Pinto stacks. And as you can see on my box, I have three of them, master, dev, and backup. Also gives you the last thing that happened on each one and by whom. Um, so now that you have your stack, to add a new module, you basically add, and this goes for most every command, you add the dash dash stack, and that will pull, uh, point that command at that stack. Now here I just basically I don't, uh, unfortunately, by the time I started putting this presentation together, I couldn't find a module that I knew that was coming out with a more modern version so I could show you how to install it. So basically, if you need to, let's say JSON already existed in a stack that we had, and now 2.9 came out, and we wanted to try out this new version, well, we can't just create a dev stack and then say, okay, let's install uh, JSON. Uh, Pinto will come back and say, JSON already exists in here. You need, to, you, know, you need to tell it exactly which version you want to override it. So you just do that with the tilde and then version number. And it will then know, okay, I'm not going for, I'm, I'm replacing the one that I have with this newer version. So that's just as an example. And as you can see then in the list down here, we have that. I also added in a new version of my source, re, uh, of my source, uh, my app, uh, just as an example. In fact, you know, in this dev test, I'm trying to figure out whether my app works with the stack that I currently have. Um, with locally added repo, uh, or with, I'm sorry, with, with modules that you're adding locally, the, the tar files, it do, it, Pin, Pinto does not do the same type of checking. It doesn't care that you already have it in the repo. It, the only thing it cares about is it, it's not the exact same version. I tried to be lazy and simply, you know, renaming the tarball to 0 .02, and it came back and said, oh, it's the same module, you just named it something different. So, it, you know, Pinto is actually rather smart that way. So now if we list, uh, we do a list on our stack dev, we can see, well, there's the version of JSON we wanted, and the old version of my module. Sorry. Okay, I probably got an old screenshot in there, sorry. Um, that should say point point, zero, uh, point, point zero 0.082 right there as part of the dev stack. And so basically to see what I've actually changed, we can do a diff on our stack. So to see the, uh, so Pinto diff from master to develop, we can see that basically we've added JSON 2.0, we've removed the 0 0.081, and we've added in my app A2. 
So that's a good way of, you know, if you've uh, made your stack and you've come back after a long weekend or after a couple of weeks, you can tell, okay, what, what have we done? What are we doing with it? So once you have your repo, and this is, this is actually where everything uh, rubber meets the road, installing from it. So you can either from the command line using Pinto if it's locally, and all these examples are local, but if you replace file with a URL where a Pinto daemon or other th uh, something else that is interfacing with your Pinto server is running, it does the same thing. But basically Pinto, where your repo's at again, install, and then without the stack, it uses the default stack, but with the stack command, it will, it will, just in, it will install my app from the dev stack. Now, this is where the CPAN comes in. Basically, you give it the, from your CPAN client, you give it the mirror that it's pulling it from. You're very important to tell it mirror only. So if my app requires URI, if I don't say mirror only, then it will start looking into the system and try to get me the most up-to-date version rather than just sticking to my, uh, my repo. Because here, the, the main goal that we're trying to do with Pinto is we have this repo, and in fact, we have a stack within this repo, and we only want modules from it installed. Um, so this is if you were going for the master, uh, the master uh, stack, again, or your default stack, I should say. If you wanted a specific stack, you simply append it to the, in this case, since it's locally, the file name or the URL. You basically, your re repo location and stacks and then your dev name. So this is the way that you can inst uh, install a module from your stack into you know, a target machine and know that you're getting exactly your modules. You don't have to worry about, are, am I pulling something else from somewhere else? Sorry. And so that's great, but you know, in my example, it's fantastic since I only have th uh, three main modules. But if, you know, if you're like any other project that I've ever worked on, you're going to have tons and tons of modules at, you know, uh, that you're going to need to be installing. And trying to write a line of, you know, Pinto install this or CPAN, you know, install from this mirror for every one, that'll be cumbersome because it's easy to forget something. So fortunately, one of the newer commands that, uh, that has just been put in is called Pinto root. So again, like anything else, we're just going to be looking at our stack dev. It shows you the root modules in your stack. So the only, app, uh, the only modules really required to identify my stack are my app, the URI, and all its dependencies, and JSON. With these three lines, you get everything that's in the stack. So then the easy thing is you just do pinto root, your stack name, and you pipe it through the cpan uh, command. Same thing. Again, I somehow left off mirror only. Um, instead of mirror, it should say mirror only. That way, it's, it'll go through and start install this one, install that, install JSON. When you're done, theoretically speaking, everything that's in your repo will now be installed, the exact versions that you're looking for, into, <coughs> pardon me, onto your machine that you're uh, targeting. Now, there is a caveat on that, which I've not been able to find an example for, and I'm going to read it for you. And uh, This comes from Jeffrey Ryan Thalhammer. It's basically... Um, Pinto only knows about, uh, about modules that are declared in the meta files, so there may be times with distributions that use dynamic configurations that something may be missed. So basically, if you have a module out there that doesn't say, I depend on these modules and its metadata, and somehow creates them dynamically, Pinto will not know about it because that's what it depends on and then not install that module. So this is, uh, this is why you would definitely have to test this out to make sure that if it works, and if for some reason some modules are missed, you'll probably have to add some lines in there. Again, I've asked several people, I Googled on it, and I couldn't figure out exactly how to identify a module that does dynamic configuration. So uh, it's uh, something that he mentioned, so I'm throwing it out there. Don't assume that this is going to be a, a goal, you know, the silver bullet for every time and if something is missing, then the module that, that the missing module is depend, it depended on has some type of dynamic you know, configuration. So that's something to look out for. So now we have our stacks, and those are great. And now what happens when we find something wrong? So let's say that my app, a, a point, uh, 0 0.82, breaks something. So while we don't want master, master being theoretically what is in our development environment, what's in our production environment, we never want to update that app until we figure out what's wrong with it and fix it. So that's where pins come in. Pin is a way of basically pinning down a module and saying, this is not changeable anymore. You can't change it until you unpin me. Unfortunately, without any type of security, anybody can go in and unpin it, but at least it's one extra step so that you're never by accident upgrading a module that you've identified to be a problem. 
this, uh, this also happens that if you pin, like uh, in the, the repo that I currently have, URI, you are also pinning every module underneath it. So if you try to upgrade URI escape, it'll come back and say, no, I can't do that because I'm needed for the version of URI that's installed here. Pardon me. So basically, this is a way of safeguarding your production stack of not letting bad things in. So once it's pinned down, and it's real easy. Pinning and unpinning it makes a lot of sense. It's basically pin, uh, Pinto, your repo name, pin my app. Once you've fixed it, you can unpin it, pull in, your, uh, pull in your new version, try it out again. If everything works, then you can go to your master, unpin, this, uh, unpin it there, and then pull it in. Again, if you identified in that this doesn't work in your production stack, you'll want to uh, pin it there and pin it in your, lower, uh, you know, in your development stack as well until, so that you, have, you know that just by ad hoc, if you were to upgrade something else, if you were to upgrade something else that would eventually potentially upgrade my app, you don't want that to go in until you're sure saying, okay, this is the, uh, this is the fix to my app. Now I want to test it out. So, um, and again, uh, to put this on, you know, uh, these commands are being done on the default stack. Uh, you just add dash dash stack and the stack name, that's how you get it. Um, again, there, that is, that's the way that I would approach the, the issue is you don't want to, pin it in your production stack, and then not pr uh, pin it in your dev stack, forget about it, and then potentially overwrite it somehow. And then now you have like these changing dependencies in between the two, which make it harder to reconcile. If you find something that breaks it, I would recommend it pinning it in all places until you're ready to fix that one problem. So the other great thing is logs. So uh, just like git logs, uh, basically you do pinto. Hmm, great. And the word log should be there. So Pinto repo log stack dev. I'm going to be fixing this before, I, before tonight. And it prints out basically uh, a SHA for what the revision is, the date stamp, who did it, and what they did. So you can see here I uh, pulled in JSON. I unpinned it, uh, my app 0.81 because I wanted to try 0.82. If uh, I would have tried adding that before I'm pinning it, I would not have been able to. So, and the, you know, the log would be, you know, a great way of once you have, uh, once you've figured out what's working and not working, and then you want to take a look at what have you done since you diverged from master, this would be one way of looking into it. So extras, there is revert. And the reason why I'm putting this in extras is because the biggest thing you see on the revert documentation page is this is experimental. But it works really well. So Pinto revert simply reverts the last, um, the last uh, command, the last action done. Again, this is, uh, this, uh, this is not in regards to stack. If the last action was adding a module to your dev stack, it's reverting that. It's not, it's not saying, oh, he didn't provide a stack, so I'm reverting the last thing done to this stack. It's just the last thing you did. Um, you can also give it a SHA. So if you basically go into the log, you find the SHA that you want to re revert, you do revert SHA, and boom, that's been undone. Again, it's experiment, experimental. Don't know where it's going to go. For right now, it works, and it actually is kind of cool. If the last command you did was the wrong command, or you fat-fingered it, and then you can just revert that out. I, li I liked it, so I'm including it. Um, now, this, so pretty much that's pretty much everything that you're going to do on the command line with Pinto directly. So <clears throat> that's great and all, but you know, until you can rem uh, you know access it remotely, it's not going to be very useful to you. That's where Pinto D comes in. This is basically a web interface API to your Pinto repo. It's, um, it's a PSGI compatible uh, with the Plaque Runner on Starman. Of course, you can change that out if you know anything about PSGI and Plaque Runner. Um, and the, uh, the nice thing is, by, uh, by default, it comes with no, well, the authentication is off, but with uh, some simple command line arguments, you can turn on some, you know, some good uh, well, some simple authentication schemes, and then obviously, again, because it is going through Plaque Runner, you can add on any type of authentication you want to. So you can create a very nice web API interface that is secure that you can then pull from. And that's not even talking about you know a server that you can then isolate from the rest of the internet that's only uh, you know available to your you know environments. But uh, so Pinto D is a good place to start for being able to instead of having you know CPAN mirror only or mirror file, whatever, now you have the ability of doing HTTP to my server, and this is where you get it from.
But for those people, that, that's just a lot of work. And it, it kind of is, and unless you're really, you know, working at a highly uh, you know, uh, sensitive areas, you can use Stratopan. Uh, there's Stratopan.com. Believe it or not, they built this web. It's a web service built on and for Pinto, and it is like GitHub basically. You create your own. Instead of creating Git repos, you create Pinto repos. You can make them public or private, and there actually they have good. Uh, good control as far as who can access it, how they can access it, and even like authorship type uh, accessing. So basically you can say, well you can have access to these files but you can't. So um, it seems to be, I, I honestly, then, other than reading their front page and basically putting it up here, I haven't looked much more into it, but if you're, uh, if you're looking you know, on, on this, you know, just for yourself to do repos, this is a nice way of getting around having to have your own server, writing your own Pinto D daemon and all that. Um, other extras which are nice, um, and, and some of these are in a kind of a, a, a state of flux because Pinto is still younger and these are more on the edges. Um, app Pinto document, uh, command document doc allows you basically from the Pinto command line to create a CPAN-like uh, web, uh, web pages which says these are, the, these are the modules that are in my repo. You can click on them. You can see the pod files. It's really nice. I would have a screenshot, but uh, uh, currently it does seem to be not working right, and I'm not seeing all of the modules, so I went ahead and skipped it. But it's still, that looks like a very promising project of basically being able to, here's our repo, and here are the web pages for it, for like some internal documentation. Um, Bash completion plugins Pinto. If you're like me, you don't want to type anything more in Bash than you have to. So this thing will complete your Pinto commands and any Pinto options that it has. Uh, Pinto Remote is an API that goes directly. Uh, it's kind of like Pinto D, but it is a little bit more basic as far as getting at the uh, command line API. Uh, so basically, this will be more from one server trying to make a straight call to the Pinto repo from, uh, to another server instead of going through the HTTP. So uh, that's pretty much getting towards the end of it. Uh, resources, uh, basically this slideshow will be fixed about half hour after I'm done here at that URL. Uh, of course, the main man page is for Pinto itself. The introduction is basically just uh, how did it come about? What was he thinking? What was his thought patterns? Inst uh, installing, obviously, how, how to install it on several, several system. This one's nice. It goes over how to install as a client and as a server. So it, does go, it gets you through the initial step of setting it up yourself as a web service. Uh, tutorials, just kind of a day in the life type thing. And quick start is you know, like that one sheet you pull out everywhere. If you just want to get up and going, this is where you go. Um, also, a really great uh, uh, article by the author of the uh, mo module is promaven.com Pinto Tutorial. Highly recommend reading that. It's kind of like a summation of all three of these, but it uh, gives a little bit more in-depth in some areas. Um, one, again, since Pinto is very early on in its, uh, in its life cycle, and the core functionality is there and it's good, but um, like uh, Root, that... Uh, that is a newer one. That one is not documented anywhere in any of these. That one came from an article that the author wrote and some other website. So, you know, as far as the more advanced uh, capabilities of it, we're still seeing much of it being developed. And, uh, you know, so, but this gives you a core, a really good core starting out for. So, any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much and hope you enjoyed the free pizza.